Hi, I'm Chad Shear. I'm founder of Informative Prior. Uh, we do uh, consulting and software development with a focus on open source statistical modeling in Julia. And I'm going to talk about applied measure theory for probabilistic modeling. So with COVID, people talk, have been talking about travel a lot for the last year. I can't wait to travel again. And the question of, well, where, where would you like to go? Kind of the joke answer is, well, let me just throw a dart at a map. But if you think about this and actually try to throw a dart, a few darts at a map, um, and maybe you think, well, I'm going to choose this, choose a destination randomly. But you really need to think about if you're going to literally do this, um, what choice of map do you use? I mean, if you use different projections, uh, this has a, a big impact on where you might end up going. So there are a couple of ways to look at this. One perspective is let's take the distribution of uh, where we might throw the darts and transform that to a distribution on the globe. And we're going to take a little bit different perspective for today and for, for the, the rest of this talk. And think of this as starting with a distribution, uniform distribution on the globe, transform that to some measure on the map, and then that will be our base measure. So the thing that we're really interested in is the distribution of where we might throw the darts relative to that base measure. So all of this is going to be relative. Every, all of the densities that we work with are going to be um, densities, relative densities between two different measures. So let's look at a toy problem to, to try to um, get a sense of, of how some of this works. So we're going to start with a beta distribution, beta distribution with parameters 1.5 and 4. And our goal will be to fit a normal distribution to approximate this. Okay, so um, just as kind of a warm up, let's start with a standard normal. So in measure theory, uh, standard normal is just a kind of normal uh, that happens to have a parameterization that, that doesn't take any names. It's kind of the default um, parameterization for a normal. And this is defined in terms of its log density. We say the, the log density on a standard normal up with, with observations x, just a single floating point value, is just minus x squared divided by 2. So this is really, really fast to evaluate. And this is a lot of the benefit of working in terms of measures instead of distributions. And you can see here, uh, so we define the log density. And if we plot the density, you get a curve like this. Now, the first objection might be, well, this isn't a, a density function because it doesn't integrate to 1. So that's true. In measure theory, we work in terms of uh, different base measures. So in this case, the base measure of a standard normal is not just Lebesgue measure, which in this case, Lebesgue measure on the reals would be in terms of um, the, the, the length of a given interval. The measure of an interval is just its length. Instead, we have a weight. So this is a weighted Lebesgue measure that we use as the base measure. So all of our, computation, all of our computations are relative to this base measure. We have the, the two-argument form of density and log density, but we also have a three-argument form that says um, the density of some measure with respect to some second measure evaluated at some x. And the way to read this is um, the two-argument form, by default, defines the log density or density with respect to the specified base measure. Okay, so we have to do a little bit, uh, uh, some extra steps to get this relative to standard Lebesgue measure. Okay, so let's look at some different parameterizations now. So in measure theory, uh, the, the package, uh, a measure can have several different parameterizations. So if we want to be able to try a few different normal distributions and a few different normal measures. Um, it's especially convenient if we can parameterize this so that the, the parameters can be over all of um, R2, right? So, so in this case, 
this allows us to do this with no extra um, transformations outside of measure theory. This, so this just works out nicely. So here's a, here's a few examples of different kinds of normal distributions. You've probably seen a lot of these. Uh, but if we use a, a mu and a log sigma, then this allows both of these to be any real number. And so this is just the definition of the, the log density. Um, you don't need to sort of study this. this the, the point here is just that we have log density defined for a given parameterization. That's what's significant in this case. Okay, so when we we're approximating a distribution, um, in this case, we have a P that was our beta distribution. And so let's call our normal distribution Q. So we're gonna have Q of theta, and theta will be a vector of length two. And the definition of Q will just be, let's make it a normal where the mean is the first coordinate and the log sigma is the second coordinate. Now again, log sigma here is, this is, doesn't do an operation. Log sigma is just the name. And by using this name, um, Julia knows to look in this particular parameterization and that's where it gets the log density information. All right, so to actually do the, um, the find the approximation, we're going to compute the KL divergence. So if we have our P given by this beta and our Q of theta that we just saw, definition of KL divergence is that the KL from P to Q is the expected value with respect to P of log P minus log Q. So in other words, um, we take lots of, we can think of this as taking lots of samples from P and for each one of those samples, we evaluate log of P and we evaluate log of Q and then just subtract those. So this happens to be exactly what we do in our log density computations. If we take the log density of one measure with respect to another measure, um, this inside the brackets is, is really what happens. So inside the brackets here is just log density of P with respect to the measure Q at some value X. Okay, so let's try some X. And we can do this using the symbolics library. So using symbolics, let's make variables mu, log sigma, and x. Then we can make script L. So this is just going to be one of these terms. So this is the log density of P. That's our beta. So the log density of our beta with respect to our normal distribution at some value x. And again, all of this is symbolic. Um, this is the value that we get. And then we can say, OK, um, Let's, let's, uh, let's look at the derivative of this. So this is going to be, this L is going to be like one of the terms where we have a, uh, a, an infinite number of these terms in the expected value. But then take the derivative with respect to mu, derivative with respect to log sigma. And then if we want to minimize this, um, we would just set these derivatives equal to zero. So you set these equal to zero and you get uh, mu is the expected value um, with respect to P of X, and that's just 0.27. And um, we've been working here in terms of log sigma, but we actually don't need to stay in that space, right? I mean, we can, we can say, well, um, in this representation, it's particularly easy to find sigma squared is just the variance. Okay, so in this case, the, uh, the KL divergence is minimized when we happen to have moment matching. So here's a, a, um, here's a plot of how this ends up looking. Uh, we have our beta that we were trying to approximate in blue, and the orange is our uh, normal or our Gaussian that we use to fit the result. Okay, so we saw a few different parameterizations along the way. I just wanted to kind of give an overview of some of the other ones that are available. These, of course, are different between different measures, but this is what it looks like for normal distribution. So we can have a of course, a standard normal that we saw first, or a mu and sigma, or a mu and sigma squared, that's the variance, or a mean and a precision, so that's the reciprocal of the variance. Excuse me, or we can have the mean and the log sigma. And again, this is particularly nice because it allows both parameters to range over all real values. And I should point out that um, the default just like in distributions.jl, 
is if you just give it two numbers, it's going to assume that that is the mean and the standard deviation. So this is compatible with the representation used in distributions.jl. Um, we can give names. We can also just give, um, in this case, mu defaults to zero. So we can just say sigma equals two. Or we have some aliases. So we can say mean and standard deviation, or we can say mu and sigma and spell out the variables. Okay, along the way, we took the log density of a beta distribution with respect to a normal distribution. But as I said earlier, if you ask for the log density, that is implicitly always with respect to a base measure. And that base measure itself might have a base measure and so on, right? So we can end up with a diagram like this. And the way we'd have to get from a beta to a normal is to traverse this diagram. Now, any log density that we evaluate will be, for example, um, if we ask for the log density of a beta, that will be with respect to a Lebesgue measure on the unit interval. So this gives us one term to work with. The, the, if we ask for the log density of Lebesgue measure on the unit interval, that will be with respect to Lebesgue measure on the reals. Okay, so now we have two terms, and um, now we're working on Lebesgue's on the reals. So now we have to go back down. But again, we don't ask for the log density of Lebesgue. Remember that any one of these that we ask for is going to give us the log density with respect to its base measure. So now, to go back down, we have to ask for the log density of Lebesgue on the reals with respect to, um, well, the weighted Lebesgue on the reals with respect to um, standard Lebesgue. Okay, so now we have to subtract that term, and then we subtract the, the log density of the normal mu sigma squared to get to our final result. And this is how, um, how these computations work, how we actually go um, get relative densities and log densities between two different measures. We have a few other things that we can do in measure theory.jl. Um, one is, a, is an IID product. Um, IID here means independent and identically distributed. So we have a collection of uh, random variables and the, the distribution or the measure of each of those are identical. And also, if we have an observation on one, that doesn't impact any of the others. So in this case, we can represent a, what, what we call a power measure that's just some measure taken to some either um, integer or, uh, or a tuple. So if we, if we take a power to a tuple, we get something like a matrix like this. Okay, so this is a collection of betas. So each one of these is between 0 and 1. In a lot of cases, we don't want independence. We actually want, um, we want conditional independence, but we want there to be some dependence on the index. Okay, this is a really common uh, way to set things up. And in this case, we have this four combinator. So we say four um, given the indices. And then typically we'll use this using the do notation in Julia. So for a given J, this is the index. We have whatever measure you like. So here's an example, four, 40, 64, do IJ, beta IJ. And we get this and you can see the, the um, even though these are independent, the, the measure does depend on the pair of indices that you take. So you can see the, the trend uh, as we go across the matrix in this case. Okay, next let's talk about Markov chains. So um, we're going to define a new chain and take a sample. So a Markov chain has some measure for initialization. So we're gonna have an infinite sequence of values um, the first value will be drawn from a normal with mean zero. And if I know that first value, and let's say that's, that takes on the value x, then the next in the sequence will take a normal where the mean is equal to that value. And we can just do this over and over and over again, and we get a, a kind of a, well, it's a random walk. Given this markup chain, now this is an infinite sequence, but we can still call rand on it the way we have things set up. Um, and in particular, we have some extra machinery to make sure that this, once you call RAND, the result should be deterministic. Okay, so RAND itself, of course, is random, but 
once you call rand then you can say for example take 100 values and take 100 values again and this should return true it's not immediately obvious because um, we can't for example just collect all the values because there are an infinite number of them and uh, finally we can evaluate this on any finite subsequence so we can take for example the log density um, of a markov chain evaluate on let's take the first thousand values that we observed and we get this we get this log density result okay so um, let's see some instantiation so this is calling rand lots of different times and for each of those calls we'll evaluate uh, the first hundred results in the in the sequence and again any any one of these sequences continues uh, indefinitely to the to to the right okay we, we've also added uh, support for likelihoods in measure theory so let's say we have some sigma and maybe we have some prior information on this that uh, this is say going to be a standard deviation and we we want this sampled from a um, standard normal but restricted to be positive so a truncated standard normal in measure theory you would write it like this we have these half distributions so we'd say the prior is half normal and then say we have some observations so for each of these n's xn is normal with mean zero and standard deviation sigma so if we have say 10 of these we would write this as d um, or whatever you want to call it is normal sigma equals 2 raised to the 10th power now now this d um, serves, serves as a kind of template so um, when we take the likelihood that will be um, that's of course the probability of observing the thing that you did in fact observe and it's considered as a function of the parameters when we take the likelihood um, that treats d as a kind of template and so we lose this information about the particular value of the parameter so um, for the likelihood uh, we have this this plot the the uh, orange curve is the likelihood um, conditional on uh, the x's that we that we've already observed now the standard thing to do uh, in Bayesian, anal Bayesian analysis is we have our prior and we take that times the likelihood and we treat this as a kind of pointwise product um, and use this to find the posterior distribution so here is the posterior distribution as it's usually expressed um, in a Bayesian context the probability of sigma given an x is proportional to the prior of sigma times the likelihood um, given that sigma and that this pointwise product is this this curve in green so we can see that from the prior um, the 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 variance has now um, shrunk considerably because of the the observations and in measure theory we would just write this as uh, the posterior is just the prior um, this is our pointwise product o dot um, is the is the symbol that you would type um, so prior o dot likelihood this gives the pointwise product of the the prior and the likelihood there are already a few packages using measure theory so uh, moritz shower has uh, mitosis and mitosis stochastic differential equations and he also has a, um, a zigzag boomerang package that uses measure theory and in particular can can sample from uh, sauce models so this can use measure theory for sparse posteriors in particular you can do this on a sauce model and then of course um, in sauce.jl every model in sauce is also an abstract measure so we actually think of a sauce model as a measure that just happens to have some kind of superpowers um, you can uh, transform it in different ways and uh, you can find out more about sauce in my talk on sauce i want to thank planning space for funding for spring 2021 for measure theory.jl and that's it thank you very much